He's the chosen one. We all know that Cartoon Network has had some great shows over the years, and I'm not just talking about the heavy hitters like the Powerhouse, City, or Renaissance era of the network. I'm talking about that collective group of shows that kept the network's legacy strong throughout the growing years. And when you've been watching this network for as long as I have, you tend to notice a lot of crap as well as a lot of gold. Throughout the years, many shows have been forgotten by the network as well as its fans, and now only come up in conversation like, remember Robotomy? Wasn't that great? Anyways, back to show everyone doesn't know about, My Gym Partner's a Monkey. They don't even go beyond that. Hell, it even has its side effects on the cartoon community. No disrespect to my fellow members, but a lot of videos fail to really look into these forgotten shows of the past. With a few exceptions, of course. So that got me thinking into a specific series that a tiny minority actually remembered. A series I felt was just swept under the rug and brushed off as a clone of other series which shared the same type of formula. That of course being the life and times of Juniper Lee. Oh, so you mean female American dragon? Juniper Lee was an animated series created by Judd Winnick. It premiered on the network from 2005 to 2007 and focused on the titular main character Juniper alongside her brother Ray Ray and her dog Monroe. She acts as the Tish Wan Z, the magical protector and bridge between the magical and human realms, thwarting the efforts of a plethora of evil spirits, monsters, and the like. The show is forgotten by many nowadays and is just known as the less popular Johnny Phantom and American Dragon clone that had nothing special going for it. I myself don't agree with that sentiment, which is why I intend to look into the show's three seasons and find out if it's worth remembering or not. So welcome to Juniper Lee. More than just a clone. I'm sick, I'm tired of hearing the same thing on the radio, same songs by the same teams, and it doesn't really matter how much they pay me, cause I promise on everything, they'll never change me. episodes do a more than great job introducing its audience to the show's wide world, along with characters, villains, and spells. The season's episodes seem to follow a pretty straightforward structure. A typical episode would usually go like this. June has a human world issue, your standard birthday party, school project, what have you. A monster realm threat appears, June's bracelet beeps, alerting her to the threat. She thwarts it, typically with the help of a banishment spell, and she goes back to her friend apologizing for her absence. The concept may seem stupidly simple on paper, but it does its best with each and every episode the season has. Throughout 13 of them, each one includes a different threat, more info on the realm of magic and spells, and slow growth for our main trio. June's friend group also does offer their fair share of entertainment throughout the season's runtime. You have June's bestie, Jody, an overachieving, kind and sweet but more or less simple-ish best friend character, the semi-cynical Ophelia, and stolen male friend Roger. Unlike the other two trios that the show is compared to so much, they don't really have anything that makes them stand out, but they are good enough inclusions for the series. Ophelia, dance with me. Roger, one, there's no music. Two, if there was music, I wouldn't like it. And three, no. The season's monsters can range from your generic beast to the most eccentric, taking examples from folklore such as the Sandman, gods like Loki and Thor, and even regular movie monsters like the world famous Mummy. Of course, they all have their fair share of changes made to them to keep the show fresh. What I can appreciate from this season, as well as the series as a whole, is that June's not portrayed as the perfect chosen one. She's not popular, not the best at everything, and pretty much has a big struggle with the whole having to protect the world deal, which I found made the show a lot more interesting whenever there comes a moment where June learns something new about being the Teshuan Z. A thing I never really paid attention to is the amount of references that the show just loves to pull out of nowhere. Like it's honestly surprising to find out how many times the show will reference stuff like Batman, Star Wars, and even Mr. T. This type of stuff should in reality make this series super obnoxious if done wrong, but honestly I never really found it to date the show in any way. That's at least coming from me. The overall design of the series caught my eye especially. It utilizes something I like to call the Samurai Jack design philosophy. Not saying Jack was the first to use this philosophy, but it's the most prominent example when it comes to design work in TV. The series uses an array of colors, of course, but at the same time, makes sure the colors don't clash in the scene, which is why, most of the time, Jack doesn't blend into snowy environments. It's an aspect that both these series have that are usually overlooked. My favorite episode from this season would definitely be Magic Takes a Holiday. Sure, it has the same sort of formula I mentioned previously, but differentiates itself from the rest of the season by offering some entertainment by having this episode's B-plot revolve around June's goth friend Ophelia. Also 
having the setting of Madame Rothschild's drama camp was a real nice touch in my opinion. In the end, the season does a pretty great job of introducing the show to its viewers, offering quality plots and villains, and just giving an overall entertaining 13 episodes for anyone to enjoy. Season 2 of the show is mostly what I can describe as more or less of the same as Season 1, except with a much more expansive world, taking us to different dimensions and meeting a wide variety of new monsters that come in different shapes and sizes. This season definitely takes more creative liberties with visual changes in a few select scenes. Nothing major, just mostly one-time changes that do make the scenes they're in stand out. Villains are a lot more eccentric than in the first season in my opinion, having designs, voices and plots that make each episode have its own identity and flair, from demonesses to even evil TV producers. Now if that's not the coolest form of irony, I don't know what is. You see chap? We've captured their imagination. In terms of favorite episodes for this season, it'll have to go to It's the Great Pumpkin, Juniper Lee. The show's few representations of an actual holiday episode. I love the reverse sort of traditions that they have for the monster world, the Halloween type atmosphere in the first act, and even the plot that the episode has for itself. It's all so very enjoyable. Even if the second act doesn't hit as hard, it's an overall good episode for the season. What is this? What do you mean, what's this? I went to the land of Guagara, traversed the Gremlifag beach, climbed Grand Gorge of Gorgia, trudged through the snow of Malapare to brave the rapids of Remulardi, survived the forest of fire and ice, swam the vast fields of nothingness, and fought Jordan the Destroyer for this! It's your protein shake! Even though I did say that each episode is more or less like season 1, some do have their moments, such as Adventures in Babysitting, which presents June discovering her powers as well as having the mantle of the Tishwanzi for the first time ever. Overall, the first season, while it doesn't bring the series to new heights or anything like that, still offers a few new things to try its best to keep the show fresh. It's not the most stand out of the series, but it's still charming enough. Now season 3 has got to be my absolute favorite out of the entirety of the series. Not only does it put its all into every aspect that the series has managed to develop until this point, you know world building, plot development and all that, but it also has managed to take the series in new directions that I honestly admire a lot. One big change in the status quo being the introduction of Leela to the main cast. Throughout two TV seasons, we've become accustomed to the main trio so much that having a new inclusion should have been an aspect to drag the series down. But in my opinion, it's made way for more storytelling opportunities and has made this season the most standout out of the three, with a more sense of a slice of life series when compared to the previous two seasons. Well, that thing today at lunch with the hamburgers? <gasps> I'm a herbivore! You can't expect me to eat that stuff. No, but you didn't have to, um, you know bury the hamburgers outside. A lot of changes were made to this season as well as a few consistent aspects. Dennis finally discovering the magic world, older villains making a return, it was all just an absolute treat to watch. A small but also pretty well executed detail I did appreciate was the return of many of the previous protagonists from previous seasons, but having a different spin on it from the last time. A prominent example of this is the season's second episode where it reintroduces Loki as well as his son Taylor. At first I thought this was going to be another one of those characters that would be integrated into the main cast, but sadly it isn't that prominent in this season, but it's still a good touch nonetheless. Taylor, son, I, I know I haven't always been the best of fathers, but I'm ready to change all that. I want us to be closer, buddies, pals, amigos. Hey, I know. What do you say we go outside, throw the football around for a while, maybe cook up some burgers? Give it up, old man. The final episode of the series will always be my vote for the best. It has everything you could ever have in a finale. The whole cast working together, higher stakes, and a great payoff, while also sticking to the same status quo. Overall, it was a great ending to the series. In reality, it's the best that a show of this style would ever get. And I would make an argument that it caps off the series in the best way possible. Jennifer Lee, I feel, was a victim of the oversaturation of many Monster of the Week cartoons that were prevalent around that time, and compared to those other shows, it didn't really have as much time dedicated to it as far as promotion goes. But revisiting it now, it's still as fun as I remember it. Its characters charming, its plots always engaging, and I feel like this should be remembered, not as a knockoff, but a good example of what shows of this caliber were like back then, and how animation has moved forward. It's not the best action show out there, but it stands out, and to me, that's all I could ask for. And in the end of this long winding journey, all I want for you to take from this video is one thing. Give shows a chance. Sure, they might not look the best, they might not show the best promise, you might not even enjoy it at first, but at least give it a chance. You never know what you might get out of it. Who knows, you might even find a new favorite. But by all means, 
give shows a chance. Huh, that's not true, Ama. Someday I might be as good of a Tershwan as you. No, Jennifer. Someday you will be the greatest Tershwan Zay that ever lived. Hey Geek, now that you've reviewed Jimper Lee, what's next? Hmm, to be honest I don't really know, but let's not worry about that. Let's just watch some good old fashioned Adult Swim. Next time baby. <laughs>